now that I've probably depressed everybody about all these things, uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, very key things that people can do uh, to protect themselves and their children against cancer uh, from all the toxins that are here. One, your first line of defense are what are called your detoxifying enzymes. Those are found in every organ in the body. Uh, most abundant in the liver, but they're also found in the lung. Uh, we discovered at strength that a lot of people who were developing smokers who developed lung cancer in their 40s were not able to detoxify the main carcinogen in cigarette smoke. So it's sort of hard to know how well you detoxify. You want to put a lot of things in your body that can increase on an epigenetic level. So literally there are foods like garlic, omega-3 fatty acids, resveratrol found in the skin of red grapes, turmeric, which is what gives curry its yellow color. Those all work at the level of DNA to increase the body's production of detoxifying enzymes. Now, why is that important? Well, you saw how the carcinogens are ubiquitous. Uh, Kathy Helzauer at Johns Hopkins looked at women with and without breast cancer and looked at one of the most uh, common detoxifying enzymes called GST, or glutathione S transferase. She found women with the lowest levels of GST had a fourfold increased chance of developing breast cancer compared with women with normal levels. Uh, the cruciferous vegetables. Now, these are broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, and cabbage. Both men and women you can't consume enough of these. You should make sure you include these every day. Uh, now, the first thing I'm gonna mention is breast cancer prevention. So there's something in cruciferous vegetables called indole-3-carbinol. Now, that can be uh, purchased as a supplement. Uh, there's a more stable, better absorbed uh, variety called DIM or diindole-methane. And so there's two types of estrogen metabolites in the human body. There's a 16-hydroxyestrone and a 2-hydroxyestrone. And so what happens again on an epigenetic level is the indole-3-carbonyl is basically able to convert the 16-hydroxyestrone to the 2. So most American women are walking around with a predominance of 16-hydroxyestrone. That hangs around in the body for a long time and it's mutagenic, so it promotes breast cancer. That's where most of it is. So when estrone uh, or estrogen is metabolized, it has to go to one of two different places. It can either go to the 16 or it can go to the two. The indole-3-carbonyl is one substance that's able to shift most of it from the 16 to the two, which doesn't hang around long. It's converted into the body and it's a very, very weak estrogen. For men, it's equally important. It's been found to suppress every type of prostate cancer there is. And then there was a study out of MD Anderson uh, two years ago that looked at people that were uh, eating the most cruciferous vegetables, dramatic decrease in the incidence of lung cancer. So it protects against all types of cancer. The reason for the lung cancer is most likely there's another nutrient in the cruciferous vegetables called sulforaphane. It's probably the most powerful uh, elevator of um, detoxifying enzymes of any nutrient that we know of. So one of the other things that is an epidemic now that is promoting cancer is uh, either being diabetic or being pre-diabetic. It's being over 10% of your ideal body weight. And we know that elevated, people with elevated fasting uh, serum sugar levels have a 27% increase in cancer mortality amongst men, 31% increase amongst women. Now, why is that? Because every time you eat white sugar, you know, refined sugar, things or anything with a high glycemic index, glycemic index is, just means how much insulin does it take to metabolize a given food? So you want to stay away from refined sugar because those have the absolute most. Things like high fructose corn syrup containing things. Every time you're 
uh, pancreas makes insulin, your liver is making something called IGF, or insulin-like growth factor, which we can measure. And that's one of the strongest tumor promoters there is. So if you're walking around pre-diabetic, you're walking around with high IGF levels and one of the strongest tumor promoters there is. So the main things that I tell people, if you want to reduce your risk of cancer, inflammation. So chronic inflammation can come from things like too much alcohol, uh, infections, uh, colitis, uh, you know, arthritis. There's a number of uh, there are a number of inflammatory conditions. A lot of people are walking around with a bacterial overgrowth in their stomach called H. pylori, have gastritis, and it's key to measure uh, certain indices of inflammation. Um, which you know a lot of integrative practitioners are doing now, and there are a number we can measure, and we can get those levels down. There are some genetic predispositions uh, people have also toward inflammation, but those drive cancer. Oxidative overload, that comes uh, partly uh, from inflammation, but it also comes from a lot of uh, food additives, uh, pesticides, herbicides, all those uh, create DNA damage that produce oxidative overload. Um, glycemic overload, we just mentioned, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more of that, but you wanna avoid white sugar and white flour. Uh, go with whole grains, best bread you can keep in the house, actually are sprouted whole grain breads like Ezekiel, because those contain enzymes, they help uh, digest it. And then detoxification is critical as we discussed. Alpha lipoic acid, uh, that's a very important uh, nutrient for people to take. A lot of people need a supplement to that for a variety of reasons. It's an antioxidant that helps reduce free radicals. It improves insulin sensitivity, so uh, your body won't have to make as much insulin and thus not as, mo as much insulin-like growth factor. It improves glucose transport, so insulin helps glucose move into cells, and we recommend between two and 800 milligrams a day. Um, then there are what we call angiopreventative compounds. This is critically important. So there are two types of what we call angiogenesis, the growth of new blood vessels around tumors. A lot of the latest cancer therapies are involved in inhibiting abnormal angiogenesis. So let's say if you cut yourself or you have surgery and you look at those blood vessels under a microscope, it's this beautiful array, very symmetrical of uh, blood vessels. So you want some angiogenesis. It's a completely different process than when a cancer starts to take over and it uh, takes the blood supply. This is like this dysmorphic morass of blood vessels. Everything about it is different. All the growth factors that create them. So there are a number of ways that inhibiting this abnormal angiogenesis. And that has to, that's one of the important things to, uh, to do with keeping cancer cells dormant. So there are nutrients in soy, uh, there are things in milk thistle, uh, quercetin in apples, resveratrol in red grapes, uh, green tea is loaded with EGCG, which inhibits only the abnormal angiogenesis, turmeric, uh, and uh, St. John's wort. There was a paper recently published, how many ways does curry kill cancer? It's about 25 different ways. I could uh, give you a two hour lecture just on turmeric. It has a host of other uh, properties as well, including anti-aging. Green tea, uh, one of the cheapest, best things you can do to lower your risk of a variety of different types of cancer. Uh, the main two that have been studied are breast and prostate cancer, but even people that consume the most green tea, uh, when they have cancer, they live the longest. Uh, so critically important on a number of levels. Um, it also inhibits angiogenesis, and it's also been found uh, to actually help chemotherapy work better. Uh, whole grains, uh, those are important uh, in uh, you know, for, they're fermented in the uh, colon. They uh, yield something called short-chain fatty acids. They help improve insulin and glucose. Uh, metabolism's also loaded with B vitamins. Uh, vitamin D and breast cancer. Uh, we know, everybody should know their 25-hydroxy vitamin D level. Uh, that's the one that's associated with a lower risk of cancer. 
We know that women with the lowest 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels that's related to your intake of vitamin D3. Now, you're not going to know how much D3 to take. If you eat a perfect diet for D3, you have salmon, you have cottage cheese, you have dairy, the most uh, you're really able to get is about 250, 350 units in a day. Uh, the least somebody needs that's living uh, at least around here or where I practice in New York uh, is about two to 3,000 units a day. And some people are just very poor absorbers of vitamin D3 like me. I take about 50,000 units a week just to keep my level uh, normal. So everybody's different. You can't guess. You've got to know your D3 levels. But it lowers your risk of every type of, of almost every type of cancer, but especially breast cancer. And a study uh, came out about two years ago showing that women with the very lowest vitamin D3 levels when they were diagnosed with cancer had about a 90% increased chance of developing metastatic disease. There's been a lot of misinformation about soy and breast cancer. Again, I could give you a two-hour lecture, but I'll give you the bottom line. Uh, dietary soy consumption, even if you've had breast cancer, uh, does nothing to increase your chance of the cancer coming back. Uh, and in fact, there was a big article, a big retrospective study where they looked at a lot of studies uh, published in the Journal of the American Medical Association looking at women that were consuming soy versus not and found it uh, increased uh, disease-free survival. Um, and the estrogens in soy are about uh, one one thousandth is the estrogen in the human body. A uh, study that was published in the Journal of the National Cancer Institute in 1998, they just looked at women that drank two glasses of soy milk a day compared to those that didn't. Uh, and they found that there was about a 25% drop in serum estrone and serum estradiol levels. So estrogens that were a thousand times more powerful than the ones found in soy dropped by about 25%. So the net estrogenic effect from soy is you've got a lot less estrogen in your body. Studies have been done in people with prostate cancer uh, with sort of lower grade prostate cancer that either elected to have prostatectomy or radiation or just changed lifestyle, went vegetarian, started doing yoga, exercising more, having green tea. And actually in the uh, group that was doing the lifestyle change, their PSA uh, actually decreased. In people with precancer of the prostate, a very nice study was done, and this has been repeated, looking at uh, an extract from green tea in people that had what's known as PIN, or prostatic intraepithelial neoplasia. Almost all those men will go on to develop prostate cancer. And uh, so there were nine cases of prostate cancer, and the ones that weren't consuming any green tea, only one uh, one year uh, in the ones that uh, were consuming the green tea. And that 30% incidence per year is consistent with the literature. So green tea critical for both men and women.